Uh, one, uh, very quickly from the comments, take a look at uh, uh, the bulk of uh, U.S. animal production and some, kind of what it looks like. Lots of exciting things. Simon Ranch and, and uh, lots of people are doing a lot of exciting stuff. And, and this may be looking a little bit boring uh, by uh, comparison, but anyway. Uh, uh, six things I'm going to talk about very quickly uh, with respect to trends, uh, with respect to traditional commodity agriculture and how it's changing. Well, first of all, uh, expanding production. You simply look, uh, I'm going to show you a lot of slides with history. This is 1960 through 05. Uh, and we'll get these slides, right, staff? Yes. Right. Thank you. Uh, annual beef production has gone from about 15 billion pounds a year in the United States to around 25, a 72% increase uh, last year over 1960. Milk production is up 44% in that same time frame. Uh, pork production up 90% uh, during those 45 years. Uh, but the real growth was in poultry. Uh, Broiler production up 716%, going from a tad bit under 5 billion pounds a year to over 35 billion pounds of uh, uh, ready to cook weight uh, broilers in the United States. Uh, Turkey a little bit less, 569% increase over those 45 years. Why? Uh, why such growth? Well, obviously there's more Americans feed. Population grows roughly 1% per year, so there's, there's more people out there to feed. Uh, per capita meat consumption goes up most every year. If you look at the graph 1960 through 2005, this is uh, on a retail weight basis how much uh, meat the average American consumed each year during those 45. We've gone from, uh, well, basically from 178 pounds of meat per person per year uh, to 237. So uh, a 59 pound per person increase. Yeah. Just a clarification that 1% population growth per year. Yes. Uh, that accounts for the exponential, the log growth that we're seeing. Sure. I mean, if you've got 1% growth each year, you've got a bigger base every year to grow off of. So you, that number of Americans we're adding each year <coughs> is a lot more than what we added 50 years ago on an annual basis for 1% growth. But we've got more Americans to feed, and we've got Americans <coughs> eating, well, a little bit more than one pound more meat per person per year. And then the other uh, reason is exports. Uh, in 1960, we exported 161,000 uh, tons of meat last year, a little bit over 5.5 million tons of meat. And that's about a 28-fold increase uh, in exports. So, uh, Primary markets <laughs> in beef? Uh, in beef, uh, uh, well, uh, Japan, uh, Korea was. Uh, now Mexico gets about two thirds of beef we export. Canada is our number two uh, customer. Thank you. Uh, second trend: uh, fewer and bigger operations. Uh, uh, don't have uh, USDA doesn't have annual data going back uh, terribly far on this. Mostly it's going to look about a 20, 25 year period. A number of farms with beef cows in the United States. Uh, 1986 we had a little over a million. Uh, now we're a little bit under 800,000, so about a 1.3% decline per year in uh, uh, farms of beef cows. Uh, number of cows per farm uh, correspondingly going up from about 33 to about 43 uh, cows per farm in the United States on average. Milk cows per farm, uh, a more rapid decline, 5.8% decline uh, right there, much more consistent decline as you can see. Uh, cows per farm, uh, Dairy cows going up pretty fast from about 25 or so in 1974 uh, to, uh, what, 160 or 70, it looks like, in 2005. Number of hog farms, uh, we have a million farms raising hogs in the United States as recently as 1967. We're now running about uh, 77,000 farms raising hogs. Uh, rate of decline about 8.8% per year. Uh, inventory on farms going up, as you can see, uh, quite fast. Uh, in uh, recent years. We've gone from 40 head per farm to uh, uh, about 900 hogs per farm last year. Uh, farm selling broilers. Uh, USDA can find uh, annual data, so I've pulled census of agriculture, this is every five years, uh, going back 1954. We've got about 50,000 uh, farms selling broilers in 54. It uh, hasn't dropped off near as fast uh, as some of the other categories. We're still at uh, 24,000 or thereabouts. Uh, in the 97 census. Uh, broilers per farm has gone up incredibly uh, because we put 
produce much more chicken. Uh, from what uh, 15,000 sold uh, per year to about uh, 275,000 uh, marketed per year in the 97 census. Uh, there is a 2002 census, but USDA uh, redid their survey process, and so it's not quite uh, uh, comparable. Uh, if you want to know when we really got out of the chicken business in the United States, it was uh, uh, back uh, in the middle part of uh, the last century. Uh, up as late as 1940, we were running over uh, 5 million farms in the United States raising chickens. And uh, we're now running about 80,000 or so uh, that raise chickens. All right, uh, why fewer and bigger operations? Uh, number one reason, I think, is simply def deflating livestock prices. Yeah, we're going to show you some charts here. The, the green in this is actual price, uh, slaughter stairs in this case, uh, 1960 through 05. Uh, the red charts, uh, which will be on the bottom, is the same price as adjusted for inflation. Uh, cattle prices are higher than they used to be, but if you adjust for inflation, we use the CPI on this, uh, the purchasing power of what you're getting is not as much as it used to be. In the case of milk prices, yes, uh, they've gone up, but they won't buy as much uh, uh, for the farmer selling it. In the case of hogs, the green nominal prices have uh, more than doubled uh, just for inflation. We've uh, have less than half the buying power of what we used to. Uh, egg prices, uh, same thing. Uh, nominal prices higher, deflated prices much lower. Chicken prices for broilers, uh, uh, nominal it's gone up. Inflation has uh, uh, driven that like everything else, but not as fast as inflation as you can see in the, the red chart at the bottom. Turkey prices, same situation. You take a look from 60 to 05, deflated. The purchasing power uh, of uh, per hundred weight per pound on uh, selling these products from the farm. These are farmer prices. Uh, cattle prices declined by 49%, milk prices by 30%, hogs down 56%, eggs down 78%, chickens down 60 and uh, turkeys down 73%. All right, since livestock prices have failed to keep up with inflation, producers have basically two choices. One, they can learn to live on less and less money year after year or they can raise more animals. Or they can quit raising livestock hopefully entirely and, and get a job in town or, or something else. Next step, uh, economies of size, uh, economics term. Uh, in general for farms, uh, getting bigger means you can buy the stuff that you need for your farm a little bit cheaper per unit. If you're, if, whether you're buying ear tags or bearing crates or uh, uh, feed, or, Pharmaceuticals, uh, if you're buying 100 of them, you probably get a little better deal per unit than if you're only buying one. Uh, selling, a little bit higher price, lots of times the savings on, on uh, selling is uh, being able to uh, ship farther and uh, with uh, larger units and tr on trucking costs. But the main factor comes from efficiency. Uh, specialization uh, and uh, getting more efficient in what you do in the interest of time. On. I've got one chart on this. Uh, that I always use. Uh, this is the uh, USDA's data from last year, pigs per litter by herd size. Uh, smallest herds averaged to seven and a half pigs weaned per litter last year. The largest herds averaged nine, had been over nine pigs weaned per litter last year. Or you can get another pig and a half per litter out of your sow if you take her off of a small hog farm and put her on a big one. What? Why? The biology doesn't change. The, the sow doesn't know whether she's one of uh, uh, 10 or one of 10,000 that's on that farm, does she? Yes. She does? <laughs> if she's crowded, I think she would well, I mean, she, that I mean, compared to... Uh, but well, what we're getting here is how many hogs the farm owns. If you want to ask the sow, I doubt she would tell you. I'm wondering if USDA explained that change. I, I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering what accounts for the difference. No, the USDA didn't explain. I can tell you, I think, well, does it? It's uh, uh, better for labor and management. What does that mean? It means that if you're a big farm down here at the bottom, you've probably got someone whose job is to fur a sow and take care of pigs. You got the top end of that. Uh, the person who's farrowing the sows is also mixing the feed, is probably planting the corn, uh, may well be uh, vaccinating uh, cattle, 
that small of operation won't generate anywhere near enough labor or income to support a family. That person's doing a lot of other things. And that's... But you're saying those sows have seven and a half pig piglets in them while the others have nine in them. Now this is wing, number wing. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Now you're, you've answered my question. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, limit utilization. And one of the challenges on small farms is this, this, it's what I call the $8 an hour job, $80 an hour job. Every farm's got a bunch of $8 an hour jobs, whether it's driving tractor, loading hogs, cleaning out uh, uh, a uh, broiler uh, barn, uh, you know, jobs that, by golly, a, a, a high school kid with a little bit of ambition and some strong back can do. You can train them to do it in, in a couple of hours. And every farm has got $80 an hour jobs with making purchasing decisions on a buy feed ahead, making marketing decisions, making decisions about uh, financing the operation. They're $80 an hour jobs. On small farms, same person does both. If that small farmer spends too much time doing those $8 an hour jobs, it's not going to generate enough income to support the family on an $8 an hour job. There's not very well. And they won't have enough experience and won't spend enough time doing the $80 an hour jobs to do them as well as when you get a little bit larger and you've got the high school kids or someone doing a $8 an hour job hour after hour and the person who's making those decisions with respect to dealing with the banker spends a lot of time preparing to go into the banker and talking to maybe several before they sign on on the bottom line on the note. Dr. Flynn, yeah. question. Sure. Today, we, uh, several people asked questions. Okay, what about the profitability on the, on the previous slide, the 7.53 pigs per sow versus the nine? I mean, obviously, it's not only, not only labor, there's a lot more capital investment in the $5,000. So he's got to worry about return on investment. Is it a lot of cost for additional manure? Uh, some say that all of are externalized, so worry about it, the community's paying, but, but still, we're, we see a chart like this, and it, it's again, it's a reminder, this is about production units, but it doesn't address the profitability, sure. and, and that, that's something that we are dealing with today, and it's very well capitalized, beautiful, well-run, clean, allegedly clean dairy, and they're not making money, so maybe we you know, can you, can you, do you have another column in that? Well, Who's I'm making more money? Well, you know, uh, uh, USDA does it, uh, uh, um, uh, that I've seen tie dollars on this. But what uh, I don't have here, but what we can tell you, is the number of farms in that top category has dropped very, very fast. The number of farms in the bottom category is increasing. Now, it could be uh, the guys in the top category just couldn't stand the tax bills and, and decided to give it up even though it was gosh awful profitable. And it could be the guys in the bottom category are looking for tax losses, but I doubt it. I would argue the fact that one size category is going away very fast is probably a pretty good indication of not making enough money to support the family. But is there a magic number? I you know, like Michael Guppy, well, wouldn't, couldn't he say 110? At the Iowa State, so there's 110. Sows is the magic number, and there is the diminishing return in terms of profitability. Well, There's once you get up to fairly a hundred sows, you've now got one FT, one full-time equivalent of labor. So you can have you've got enough hogs for somebody to spend all this time worrying about is this hog operation going to make money, and he's probably going to do a better job than the person who's spent all his time worrying about get the crops planted, the combine repaired. Uh, the cows vaccinated, uh, and oh, by the way, I need to uh, run over and check the sows and see if uh, she heard uh, all yet. But, but you're also assuming in that that because one segment of that operation may not be as efficient, uh, that the whole farm is less efficient, which I think is a false assumption. I'm just that, I'm, that farmer who knows how to do the combine sure. repair, his own combine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh may in fact have a more efficient operating farm on the whole, even though he doesn't have as many pigs per litter that he's weaning. Well, that's true, but okay. we yeah. argue that. But we do know that the, num 
uh, most of those guys seem to have decided they can farm without the hogs. But the problem I have with this as a farmer is, you know, we always try to tell farmers that they're more productive if they have more bushels per acre or if they have more, wean more litters per sow, etc. But that's only one small piece of the equation. It doesn't tell you how profitable a farm is over a decade-long period, and as a farmer, that's what I got to worry about. Sure. <coughs> it's it's uh, more than a way of life. It's a business. You got uh, bills to pay and, and a family to support. A specialized farm. Another dramatic change. This is off census agriculture, uh, and I start with that 1950 column. This, the chart shows what percent of the farms in America had these species in the first census year. 1950, that first column, 6% of all the farms in America had sheep. 75%, three out of every four farms in America had beef cattle. Over half of all the farms in America in 1956, 1950 raised hogs. Two out of every three farms in America had milk, at least one milk cow, and 78% of them those four out of five had chickens. At 1950, we had a lot of what I call old McDonald farms. One point here and a moo moo there. I mean, it was on. You know, take a look at those uh, last four farms. Wasn't columns. that long ago. <laughs> yeah, I'm old I, I, remember that. <laughs> I grew up on a farm that had uh, chickens. We sold eggs. We only had one milk cow for all. We had uh, uh, pigs and beef and corn and wheat and barley and oats. Grain store and hay, and no higher labor. Uh, same trend is happening though in crops too. It's not just uh, uh, livestock specialized. Corn has gone, it's a shorter time frame. I couldn't find the 1950s. Uh, 64, almost 44 percent of all the farms in America raised corn. Uh, the 2002 census down to 16. Wheat from uh, almost a quarter of all farms down to 8 percent. Uh, our crop farms are specializing too. Uh, why? You can't learn to do 50 things as well as you can learn to do 10. If you start reducing number of enterprises, you can specialize your time and figure out how to do uh, those 10 things better than you do 50. Contracting. Next trend I want to talk about. It's interesting. Over 90% of the U.S. chickens are raised by farmers who own no chickens. Uh, Three-fourths of all turkeys in the United States are raised by farmers who own no turkeys. 45% of the hogs in the United States are raised by farmers who own no hogs. Those contract, production contracts, many self-employed farmers make a living raising livestock and poultry without having to own livestock or poultry. Uh, chart, uh, this is the University of Missouri survey simply looking at uh, uh, hogs. And uh, uh, we've done it several years in cooperation with Iowa State University. Uh, 97, 2005. If you look at how fast it's growing, 17 percent of the sounds were fared under production contract in 97, 22 percent in, in 2000, 29 percent in 03. We'll send out a survey again in January and we'll have 06 numbers. Uh, net hogs finished, it's gone from 30 percent to 41 percent of the hogs finished in the same six year period. So it's growing very fast now. Uh, why? Why production contracts? Well, from the contractor standpoint, the, 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 individual of the firm that owns the critters. It reduces capital requirements. You don't have to buy land. You don't have to have buildings. The, your livestock, your poultry are on somebody else's farm, and they're putting up some of that money. Very often, you're sharing the production risk. A lot of times, the payments are tied to performance, so you're sharing that somewhat. And you're shifting the site risk. If the neighbors are unhappy, it's not your barn. It's somebody else's. So, so could you include manure and site risk? Yes. Uh, odor is the big uh, uh, externality with the manure uh, that comes with the cycles. Uh, from the grower standpoint, why are farmers uh, choosing to raise livestock under a contract rather than on themselves? One, it reduces capital requirements. You don't have to buy livestock. You don't have to buy the feed. And you don't have to take, well, we'll get to that one. Uh, you share your production risk if, uh, in a lot of these contracts. The big thing is you're shifting the market risk to the contract. Under these ranchers, you're not buying feed. Corn prices have been running. Someone was talking about that earlier. They're darn near double today in Missouri what they were a year ago. They're darn near double. If you're raising hogs or chicken under contract, you care less. You don't buy feed. With respect to selling hogs, we talked 
earlier about the 1998. We well, do care because if that contractor goes out of business or the guy goes out of business, you don't have a business. Either. That's right. So it's going back to what Jeff said. You, you, everybody's got to win. That's right. So you do care. But it also, it also depends on the kind of contract that you get, as Neil Hamilton's work has pointed out so clearly. True. With respect to that market risk, it's huge. This is just simply for hogs. The good years and the bad years. Uh, we talked earlier about 1998. Uh, huge, huge losses uh, uh, for hog producers. And some very good years in there also. This is for the owner-operator type. All right. Uh, in our last survey, one of the questions we asked uh, uh, hog farmers were uh, to give us a, a, a rating of how satisfied are you with hog production. Just gave them a score. Uh, respond with a one if you're very dissatisfied, uh, six if you're very satisfied, or pick a number in between. For independent producers in our survey for 2003, the average score was 3.7, pretty well close to the middle. Uh, kind of uh, uh, some happy, some just uh, unhappy about it. Contractors, these are people who own uh, hogs on somebody else's farm, a much happier group. 4.7 was their average score. And finally, the growers, the people who are raising somebody else's hogs. 4.9. The happiest hog farmers in America in our last survey were those who didn't own any hogs. But were raising somebody else. With the market conditions that have changed since 2003. We're going to do the survey, the same yeah. question, and by gosh, I sure hope so, Bill. Yeah. Uh, the price has been much better yeah. now, and I think that this number here yeah. uh, hopefully will go up. There should be a lot of new trucks and people yeah. out there now. Yeah. Yeah. What are the drivers? Uh, did you get uh, come to understand what drives these data? Well, uh, with respect to, uh, this is a fairly new question we didn't have in our historical series. I think Bill's hit on the number one thing that drives that top one. How much money did I make last year? Uh, this, this was uh, our 2003 survey. It was mailed out in January of 2003. was not a good year to own hogs. $30 hogs. Yes. And so I suspect that low rating reflects the fact they just spent a year raising hogs. It's not why are you so far behind on this? Uh, it's costly to do this. We do it every 2003, Thursday. Today's 2006. Uh, the 2003 survey was mailed in January of 2004, collecting data for 2003. In January of 2007, we'll mail the 2003 survey. We do it every third year. Oh, every three years. This is a national survey. Yes. Uh, the, uh, uh, we get a, you can see the list of sponsors done. University of Missouri and Iowa State, Pork Magazine, Pork P PIC, National Pork Board, Monsanto, Land Lakes, takes part of list of sponsors to pay the bill. Uh, for It's a huge survey. But oh. you really can't make conclusions until you have more points of the data when the market's bad, when the market's good. Sure. To see, you yes. need to pick one point after a bad hog market. Right. Of course. The ones that aren't owning the hogs are going to feel bad. But right. it's interesting, the ones that, that are growers are almost a lot on a six point scale. I'm not saying it's a good thing or bad thing. It's just interesting that it's that high. I yeah. wasn't thinking it would be that high. Well, you know, I, I think prices are going to pull this one up. But one of the key things, with these kind of scores down here, there's no reason not to expect a lot more contract production. These people are very happy with what they're doing and are likely to do more of it. Now, if we can get hog prices up, these guys are going to be a lot happier, too. I'm, I'm confident. Because the money's in the fair line, really. Yes. Not in fine. And the skilled labor is in, in the fairing, sure. too, not, not the fairing. Yes. Okay. Uh, all right. Another thing with respect to uh, uh, production contracts. Uh, start. If you want to be a new hog farmer and you want to have enough pigs so that you're a full-time hog farmer and you don't have to uh, plant uh, soybeans or uh, drive tractor, those type of things, and we're going to do it in confinement, and I'm not going to get a premium for my hogs, I don't have the uh, privilege of selling to nine, and I'm going to sell to on the commodity market. And I want to be independent. I'm going to need about seven hundred thousand dollar investment to get me enough uh, land, buildings, uh, pigs, uh, feed to keep me fully employed. If I've got a good relationship with a banker, I can probably borrow half of that. Which means I got to cough up half. So I need three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and I can be an independent owner operator, fair to finish hog producer, including the land. You said. Uh, enough land, i got to have a spreading contract to put the manure on somebody else. Uh, I 
I've got enough land for my buildings, but not enough land for the manure. I need a, an agreement with somebody else. It's great. All right. But say I want to do a contract. I don't need 700000 500000 will get me there because I don't have to buy the critters or the feed, and I don't have the risk issue. And the bankers will loan me a lot more. 15% equity is usually enough to get. Uh, so I can be an independent producer if I've got half of this or 350000 to put in it, or I can be a contract grower if I've got 15% of that or 75000 it's a lot easier to find young men and women who've got 75000 and want to get into the hog business than those who've got 350000 and want to get into the hog business. Efficiency. Uh, uh, our farms get better what we do. This is beef and field production on a cow carcass weight basis per cow in the United States for those same 45 years. This is milk production. Uh, uh, very, very consistent improvement year to year by our dairy industry. Uh, hog production. Uh, uh, Parks weight pork produced per sound per year. Uh, you know, and again, I've got more data on hogs. Than we have been able to improve efficiency fast enough. This is, of our state series, prepared to finish our operation, the actual nominal break even price cost of production uh, for the last 25 years or so. One missing year of data. Adjusted for inflation or not? No, not this is nominal. They're actually producing hogs cheaper in 05 than they were 25 years earlier. Adjusted for inflation, they're producing hogs at less than half the cost 25 years earlier. It's what it was the year, the, that year we get, that uh, we're looking at. This is uses uh, commodity prices for corn and for hogs, uh, and the, throw in the efficiencies, uh, uh, that uh, have gotten better over time. Why do we get more efficient? Well, knowledge accumulates. We know more than we used to, and, and we don't forget it all. Although I'm getting to the age bill where I forget more all the time, it seems. But uh, okay. uh, excuse me again. Have you done any inquiry as when with the recent change in corn and soybean? And what effect that's going to have on uh, the trend? Certainly, we know it's going to raise costs. Uh, yeah, when we looked at history, uh, we're looking at much higher, obviously, corn price basically doubled, uh, a little bit $3, uh, $3 a bushel, give or take, right now uh, uh, in Missouri. Uh, we look back at history, we've had high price corn in the past bill. Uh, as you know, what tends to happen is. Uh, uh, Not this time. <laughs> what tends to happen is corn hog farmers decide they'd rather sell corn than feed it. When corn prices get high enough, and I say, those hogs are an awful lot of work. Uh, and they're eating $3 or $4 corn. Yeah, but you got a $500,000 debt service. Those you? guys stay. It's, they're stuck. It's yeah. They're stuck. It's the ones who've got the building paid off and are 57 years of age and saying, you know, do I want to keep working this hard? And I'll sign those sites. Man, I sell that corn for three and a quarter of a bushel, and, uh, and they work a whole lot less. Off yep. the PowerPoint, what do you think is going to happen? What What do you think the impact of these change energy and commodity prices for grain, corn, and soybean? What, what's going to happen this year, next year, maybe in the future? I think uh, using farm fish crops to make fuel is going to take corn to three dollars a bushel where it is and keep it there. The last eight years, we've averaged uh, in the Midwest about uh, two dollars and a dime for corn, and I think uh, we're going to average more than three dollars and a dime in the next eight years. I'm looking for at least a dollar a bushel higher corn prices here forward because of uh, uh, ethanol. Will meat prices go up, and will consumers stand for that? Consume less. Meat prices will go up because. Uh, these farmers don't, don't raise them as a hobby. We've got to pay the bill. Feeds the big bill. Will consumers pay it? Yes, they will. It's cheap. But one of the, the things, exciting things about niche markets and stuff, and why I think you're going to be, continue to be more and more successful and stuff, is food's so cheap, people can pay more for it and are willing to. So I'm not worried 
about consumers walking at little highway parks. Technology uh, <coughs> changes things. As a quote to one of my colleagues, uh, uh, technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. It changes things. And uh, again, one hog slide uh, of our first survey. Uh, we do it every third year. This is 97, 2003. This question we've asked three times now in the survey. Simply, uh, use of artificial insemination uh, in breeding. Uh, as you can see, small farms to big farms. In our 2003 survey, 100% of the sows bred by those farms that marketed over 500,000 per year was bred by AI. Uh, it's grown. But the point I, I want to point out is here is small farms are dumping too, but they lag. The bigger farms tend to adopt new technology a little bit quicker. It's, it's a challenge for us, an extension, to try to close that gap down. But uh, it's, it's a fact. And impacts on all this stuff. Uh, can, can I yes, sir? go back to efficiency? Sure, sure. Do you have any data that shows that um, mm -hmm. the increased use of hormones impacts efficiency? Uh, the, the big area uh, is probably uh, implants uh, in cattle. Uh, with respect to uh, ionophores that are used uh, to stimulate growth in the owl. I think there's fairly uh, uh, hard and concrete uh, uh, data that shows that uh, implants, growth implants in cattle will improve feed efficiency and rates of gains. Hormones aren't used in things. You, you meant subtherapeutic yeah. antibiotics for difficult growth. Right. This question is. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. 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 Builds up a whole new question. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're talking about the use of antibiotics to promote growth. How does that correlate with efficiency? Do you have any data on that? Well, uh, if it uh, in, in, anything that enhances the growth rate is going to improve your, your feed efficiency, you're going to use less feed to get there. Realize uh, you, uh, any living organism uh, is going to burn calories to stay alive. You've got to uh, maintain your heart beat and stuff. If you don't grow today, you still burn calories. So if we eliminate all those hormones, it's going to impact these slides to some extent. Yes. Yep. Uh, with respect to, uh, one of the things that's changed dramatically is that we move pigs indoors. Uh, in 1960, fewer than 10%, uh, and, and I'm I don't have hard data on that. Our last survey, 92% of hogs in 2003 were raised indoors in the United States. Uh, and one of the challenges, especially for getting farm, I mean, it's expensive. If you look at uh, the last couple of years, it, U.S. farmland is going up real fast. Uh, I don't have the time for, for that. But one of the things that's changed, basically the Clean Water Act, this is some old pictures here. and. Uh, uh, if you lived in uh, in the Midwest back way back when, uh, 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 a lot of uh, uh, situations, uh, nice green grass on this side of the pig fence, and on that side that's dirt and rocks. Uh, of how uh, Missouri uh, farming used to look like before uh, the Clean Water Act came along. Uh, it's a wintertime picture. Uh, it's dirt and. Uh, what we always call pasture hog production, but uh, it's the only green is on this side of the fence. And the manure management system back in those days was every time it rained, we flushed. Uh, manure went, and a whole lot of the dirt with it went down when it rained. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, uh, uh, Gray Evans, who worked for uh, Missouri Department of Conservation, uh, said the two most destructive things he saw in Missouri uh, farmland was uh, during his uh, 37 years was uh, strip mining and pigs on dirt. Uh, but uh, that's gotten to be pretty well a uh, uh, thing of the past. Uh, anyway, healthier animals, indoor production uh, makes it a lot easier to protect animals from, from the weather, obviously, from parasites, uh, disease character, carriers, we keep them isolated. Uh, the old, uh, you know, uh, go out and scatter feed on the ground and let the pigs eat it. Uh, 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 and you know you run into a fair amount of uh, worm problems with that. <coughs> a chart that you'll have uh, to keep this is one of my vet colleagues put together over time is sort of the incidents and problems 
uh, with respect to uh, uh, respiratory diseases and, and different types of diseases and, uh, associated and parasites, uh, uh, how that's changed. Anyway, death loss, there's no real good national data on uh, death loss the way we count things. Uh, uh, this is pigs per sow per year national average. It's We're getting more pigs uh, per sow per year. Part of that is more uh, live births, but another part of it is less death loss. The Canadians uh, do uh, provide national data uh, on uh, pigs born alive and pigs weaned, and this is uh, percent uh, death loss in Canada, and their technology and stuff is pretty well the same as ours. 1996-97 uh, is running just a tad bit under 10% uh, pre-winning death loss, uh, and more recently somewhere <coughs> at 8 and quarter percent. So uh, death loss is coming down. Uh, let's feed, uh, as I said earlier, uh, uh, this is uh, some numbers on uh, whole herd feed conversion. How many pounds of feed it takes to produce a pound of gain? Again, there's no national data. I'll show you three different data sets. This is a family hog farm we got in Missouri that's uh, cooperated with us through a couple of generations now on sharing data. And uh, their uh, whole herd feed conversion, and it's very, very, very well dropping about 2.1% per year uh, over this 15-year uh, period. Uh, this is one of the top 10 hog producers in the country that shares some data with us. They're running about a 9 tenths of a percent improvement, and this is just on finishing feed conversion uh, over the last 15 years. This is a uh, record uh, system uh, that has several farms on it that uh, one of them shared uh, data with us. They're looking at about a 1% per year improvement in feed conversion over uh, about a 15-year period here. How do you explain that? Well, basically, uh, uh, there's, there's lots of things that, that drive this. One is uh, the biggest change in the hog industry is moving pigs indoors. When you take them indoors and get the extremes in the weather away from the animal, you take away the need to burn a lot of calories to heat the body. I mean, you put a pig outdoors in the winter, the first thing he's got to do is keep himself warm and he's going to burn calories to do it. You put him indoors and you generate a, a lot of heat in the confinement. And if they're still short, we turn on a little propane uh, and uh, generate the heat that way. So we don't have to burn the calories in the feed. If you drive down death loss, Realize every pig that dies, we have to feed for a while, but we don't have any product to sell. So if you can drive down death loss, you'll drive up your, your feed efficiency. Uh, with respect to, uh, I'm sure there's undoubted genetic progress in here. It's hard to tease all this stuff out. But the, um, those graphs don't correlate with indoor outdoor, do they? I mean, I assume in 91. Uh, this one probably did. Uh, these, this is a, uh, a large integrator, and I'm sure those were all indoor over time, and I, I, and the bulk of this on the system were probably indoor through this entire period. But these don't do comparisons between no. indoor and outdoor. No. That's what would be important. Well, and the, 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 the studies that were done at Ohio State University, I mean at Iowa State University on the, the hoop barns, which are, you know, in terms of weather, it's not much different than whether you're outside or in the hoop barn. They had slower gain in the wintertime, but actually faster gain in the summertime. So balanced in terms of the net to the farmer, again, the net income was was a wash. All right. If you look, this is an interesting graph. This is 1930. Long trend I'm going to show you. Uh, last 75 years or so, uh, the red line is how much pork we produce each year, and basically it's been pretty consistent. It goes up down. Variety things. One and a half percent more pork per year. Uh, it's been the long-term trend for 70-some years, one and a half percent more pork per year. I just said feed conversion looks like it's improving about one percent per year, which means U.S. pork production is growing three times as fast as hog feed consumption, and it's growing three times as fast as manure production. Because we're covering the bulk of the growth with improved feed efficiency. No. If we if this would only grow at one percent per year, then we'd be making the same amount of manure to produce one percent more pork. We're only covering about one percent of this one and a half percent growth. In Iowa, we talked about the fact that in the last 
funny is not many more pigs, it's just that it comes in different space. Where is the new pig production? Well, uh, in North Carolina? Well, if you look, yes, uh, uh, North Carolina went from the 17th largest hog producing state to number two. Uh, Oklahoma went from maybe the 26th, the largest hog producing state, to number five, I believe, now. Uh, so uh, we've, we've moved uh, hog production away from the corn belt. So. But wheat produced in Iowa would have gone up. Numbers did. Numbers did, but wheat would have gone up. Okay, fewer and wealthier farmers, and that fewer number you. Uh, this is just USDA's uh, ERS's data, uh, U.S. household income. The green line is national average for all Americans, uh, household income 1960 through 2005. Uh, the red line is USDA's estimate for farm household income. Uh, they changed the way they did it, uh, uh, did their calculations back in the mid 90s. But anyway, uh, we've gone from a situation in which farmers were chronically below average as far as household income. Uh, to a situation for the last uh, decade now, the average farm household income has been higher than the average American household income. Uh, last year, $16,617 higher, according to USDA. Now, so is that right? off-farm income for household income? Yes. It and is. In, in the earlier period, is it just on-farm income for household income? All right. The, uh, the uh, gap there is, is where they change. This uh, is off the arm survey, which is uh, you go out, you talk to them, and you find them. This was a back calculation off of uh, net farm income. So, well, it's, you know, there's a gap there, and that's a change the colors. Mm -hmm. You know, whether USDA has done a good job of estimating this or not, are you surprised with it? Because it seems contrary to conventional wisdom. Yeah. I feel like we're producing more food with a lot fewer farms. I see that. Well, you know, so what's going, what would you think would happen to income? Uh, consumers. Last uh, bit. The retail prices meet 1960 to 05. This is uh, off the CPI. Uh, surveys each month. This is grocery store prices of meat. Uh, beef is uh, the most expensive. Uh, pork, uh, turkey is the gold line. Broilers is the, the, the green line there. Just for inflation, it looks like that. Uh, it's not kept up with inflation. Uh, what's the deal? Uh, 1960 last year's prices, just for inflation. Beef was 23% cheaper than in, in 1960. Pork, 27% che cheaper. Uh, chicken, 62% cheaper, and turkey, 71% cheaper in deflated dollars. Uh, all right. ERS, USDA's data on uh, meat expenditures uh, as a percent of disposable in, uh, personal income. Uh, 1970, which is far back as we find a consistent string on this, average Americans spent 4.2% of their disposable income to buy food. Buy meat, pardon, to buy meat. 4.2% of disposable income to buy meat, and they bought 194 pounds of it on average that year. Last year, the average American spent only 2.1% of their disposable income to buy meat, and they got 221 pounds for it. How, how much has their disposable income gone up? Oh, gosh. Uh, it, it would have gone up uh, something like that green line. Uh, one heck of a lot. Percentage, so it still doesn't tell you much about the actual price of meat that, that they're spending less of what, more. You want the price of meat? It's right there. there. Yeah. There's the price of meat. The key thing about this, from my opinion, is is where we are. 2005, 2.1% of disposable income to buy meat. That's national average. You take the top end of the scale, those with above average income, and we're down 1% one half of one percent of our income being spent by meat. Why you got a good teacher in front of you? There's lots of people with lots of money that when we're down to one percent of your income going to buy meat that can ask for specific products that are taste better or more environmentally friendly or whatever, it's in the 
So the opportunities for niche marketing, I think, are just going to continue to grow because food's cheap. We don't have, fortunately, very many people in America struggling to come up with the money to feed their families. And as you said, not only is in essence half as much of a share of your disposable income, but uh, you got another. But some of these production gains, some of these production gains are because of genetic selection. For for example, a percent of breast meat of chicken in, in 1998 might have been 17 percent, and now it's 27 percent through genetic selection, changing nutrition. But there's always a trade-off. When you get something through genetic selection, you give up something. So there's a school of thought that says it's very bland. But we're talking about all these production games, but we aren't talking about the other side of the question. With respect to flavor, the flavor in meats and fat, uh, you know, it's a real dilemma for the, the uh, livestock industry. Consumers keep saying, take the fat out, and we have. And then some people are surprised it doesn't taste as good. There are genetic lines of hogs that, you, that taste better. Also tend to be a little bit fatter. You know, there's trade-offs in the world. Michael, you got a question? Uh, We're going to move things along time-wise Just here. Uh, quickly, uh, maybe that was the same question, or some of the externalities. Uh, we keep hearing about you know, actual costs of food, and meat in particular, much higher for Americans than we appreciate. $4 uh, we're, we're plus gonna, a pound to buy beef at a grocery store. No, I'm, I'm talking about uh, when you start adding environmental impacts and, oh, oh. and so forth, and uh, public health concerns uh, about disease transmission through the food supply, on and on and on. Yeah. Do you have figures that would add those costs in? I think we need a health economist probably on that one, but... Uh, uh, no, I certainly don't. The externalities, uh, you know, are... Are certainly there, and how you uh, you know measure them. One of the things uh, you go back and look at some of this stuff, uh, you don't see much of that. Uh, the, the Clean Water Act and, and the pressure that put on uh, uh, livestock farms really cleaned up a lot of the erosion problems and stuff. Uh, it gave us odor problems. Uh, uh, you know, you scatter these critters a lot, and you end up with a lot of erosion outdoors. We can find them when we handle that water quality, and we start getting odor problems. So there are trade offs, and I, no, I don't uh, have an estimate. For That's not a nightmare. No. These are very pictures. These are very pictures. That was your question? <laughs> it's Michael Joe's fault. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, are you, uh, okay. you're done. Okay, other questions for Dr. Plain? He's real plain when he speaks. That's, that's, that's a good name. <laughs> can, you, can we take, can you describe the future as you see it? Just the, are, there, are these trends inexorable? Pretty clear from all your graphs. Uh, the efficient is uh, uh, we'll get better. Uh, knowledge accumulates. And there's new technological breakthroughs. We're going to get better. Uh, I think uh, the, the eating quality, the, the flavor is going to be one of the big growth things coming because uh, we can afford it. And a lot of this stuff doesn't taste as good as it can. And uh, we can make the food taste better, but starting at the farm. And so I see that's a growth area. I've always said I think feed price is going to go up. And the cost of production is going to go up. Meat prices are going to get more expensive in the grocery store. I think consumers will pay it. It's still a bargain. We can afford it. Uh, Beef shows that, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you go, yeah, take a look at beef prices uh, uh, the last, uh, in 2004, 2005. Uh, very expensive. The trend is the other way right now, though, isn't it? Uh, we're looking at ninety dollars uh, for a uh, slaughter steers from now through spring. Uh, part of it uh, uh, is that we are regaining slowly the export market that's soaking up some of the growth, uh, and that's going to be a, 
I think we will get back to a very slow process in years rather than months. Yeah, food is cheap, and uh, there's a niche market. I should take all my money and go be a hog farmer tomorrow, start a hog farm. That's what I should do, and get a match to compete with him. But what's happening here is all the small, I mean, except for a couple of high school kids we saw in Iowa, I don't see any of these young people going into this industry. So how do you get, how do we get more, more of those people, how do we get more farmers? I mean, you're saying that that's, that's what we should do. But the slides certainly say that, you know, we're going to end up with less than we will continue every year to end up with less and less. Well, uh, I mean, several things. Back at the start, I had uh, these sizes. Uh, as, you know, as farms get bigger and as they specialize, we don't need as many. You know, that farm I grew up on, uh, where we had sold eggs and had a milk cow and some beef cows and some pigs and, and corn and beans and we you could have a whole bunch of 160 acres uh, plus a little bit of pasture. I understand that, but Bill's 500 farmers then are going to dwindle. He's got to go compete for farmers. We're going to end up with 10 or 12 major companies doing everything, all the food for the world for the United States, according to what you're saying to these slides. Well, that's the issue. If I'm wrong about consumers willing to pay no, I'm not saying for these you're wrong niche about markets, that. you're right about that. Well, then we're going to create new firms. Simon Ranch is a new firm. Uh, you know, uh, Conagra, and we should Cargill. Be more, more people jumping at it to go into this business. Well, that's it's Jeff's going to find them. We're going to we're going to help them. We're going to bring more people back. <coughs> what Bill has done with Nyman Ranch is not all that easy. He's a sharp man. Well, you know, as far as You're not listening to my question, okay. so never mind. <laughs> on, the, on the slide where you showed that farmers make sixteen thousand dollars a year more than the average American, that's family. This is not per person; it's per household. How does that take into are those actually family farms, or is it looking at a corporate farm and what they're making? The survey is done of individuals uh, and their families, not of uh, what slide was there of uh, corporation. How much of that is because uh, you're uh, surveying the owner of a large farm uh, that's got uh, lots of employees? Uh, and that's I'm sure part of it. Well, there's two other questions about that that are important. One is, what is that adjusted for inflation? And then secondly, uh, is what's included in household income? Well, and I, I, from my understanding of USDA, household income includes the whole, it yes. includes the off-farm job, yes, et cetera. Yes, yes. So it doesn't tell us much about what the farmer actually earns from the farm adjusted for inflation. Sir, yes, you're right. Uh, ERS has got that data. I don't have it. They've got it. Doc, what would you project for rural communities in the future? Or is there no future for rural communities except this bedroom community? I mean, if, 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 the, if the size of farms, right? The, the most important thing, in, in my opinion, on how your rural community is going to do is a simple issue of where in the United States is it located. If it is located in the high Plains. So I'm not the, from Texas Panhandle north to Canada, all, uh, right on through Canada, people, farms, and cities have been losing population at a pretty fast clip. And I argue there's one simple reason for that. Weather is really not a whole lot of fun there, and people are figuring it out, and they're going to move elsewhere. The, the growth is where, the, where it's nice to live. The Intermountain West is growing very fast. The South is growing fast. People are moving to weather, and they're, and the job, and they're taking jobs, and that's where the jobs are growing. So it'll be very tough on farms in those in the, the well, high plains. That, that, that doesn't quite square though, because in North Dakota, populations in cities like Fargo are growing very rapidly. It's in the countryside where there's the loss of farm populations, 
And you can't tell me that farmers are less adjusted to the weather than the people living in Fargo. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not, it's, you know, it's, it, it's not weather that keeps people from these communities. It's, uh, it's uh, the lack of income uh, from the farming operation. If you take a look, for example, at the growth in the Intermountain West, I don't think you can show that it was income that attracted those people. In. Well, there's a lot of things about the Intermountain West. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, playgrounds for a lot of rich folks. Uh, I mean, it's a uh, it's Ted Turner and et cetera. You know, it's a. Uh, I mean, you got to look at the whole system, not just as one one piece. But um, it's. Uh, I mean, there's. Yeah, yeah. You know, if 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 picture that you're presenting looks like it should be very positive for farmers, especially young farmers. And why is it then that only 6% of our farmers now are under age 35, the first time in the history of U.S. agriculture? That's what I was trying to ask 10 minutes ago. Oh. That's the oh, question yeah. I asked. Thank you. <laughs> because you know, the, the answer to that is real simple, because there's nobody to make that farmer retire. The average age of an American farmer goes up with life expectancy. My dad was a farmer so the day he died, the last thing he did was went out and fed the cows, came back, parked the tractor in the shed, started to walk the house, had a heart attack and died. He was a farmer until the day he died. Now, most occupations we shell people out are under some sort of retirement plan. The farmers we don't, and so we keep those 80-year-old farmers on the books. And when we do it at an average age survey, do they? And you throw in some 80-year-old farmers, and boy, you pull that average up real quick. On the flip side, the you know, new farmers coming in, the big challenge, somewhere in there I have the graph, uh, the biggest challenge for new farmers, yeah, that's it. Poor to buy the land. Whether I'm going to raise, you know, even in find them, I need some land, or whatever. I need land. How do I finance How much is that? However, influenced by farmland that goes to, I'm sorry, to subdivision shopping malls and so forth. It, it, it's that. Well, it's sure. Yeah. You're right, absolutely. So but I still get, you know, if I want to buy it, that's the price I got to pay. You got to compete with it. You, uh, you have fewer companies, uh, like in, uh, in uh, Missouri now, Smithfield is buying up premium standard farms. Uh, so you have. Growing concentration of a few companies involved in the pork business. I'm not sure what kind of a bargain that was because Premium Standard Farm just lost a uh, lawsuit to four or five out of 50 farmers, uh, paying them $4.5 million as a start. That's the judgment, and then they're going to settle with all the rest. I'm kind of a, uh, maybe they're getting a bargain. But you have growing concentration in, in the food system. What does that? Ha how does that play out in terms of efficiencies or in terms of uh, contracting? Well, all right. One of the things uh, I think uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, with, yes, with respect uh, to uh, uh, my talk about contract, it depends on whether the other guy uh, uh, lives up to his end of the deal. Well, one of the first things we tell uh, farmers who are thinking about signing a contract is who's on the other end of that? Is it somebody with deep pockets and preferably an out-of-state corporation that if they try to default, you can drag them into court uh, uh, before a local jury and there's nothing that you know, you'd know you rather do be able to sue some big out-of-state corporation for defaulting on a contract. So. If that's who's on the other end of it, <coughs> then you've probably got very low risk of default. On the other hand, if you're raising those hogs under contract for your neighbor, back to the 1998 debacle in hog prices, uh, a lot of hog, I mean, uh, we lost a huge amount of money, a lot of hog farmers went broke. Some of them were contractors and in essence, defaulted on the contract with their neighbor, and the neighbor is in a situation, he defaulted, I can sue him, right? Well, you can't get blood out of a tournament, tournament, and you don't really want to sue your neighbor anyway. So his financial problem became your financial problem. With that, I'm going to have to bring this to a close.
I want to thank you. You're, you're one of your last moments.